Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me today is Tho Bishop, also here at the Mises Institute. And our guest today is Peter St. Ange, and he's with the Heritage Foundation. He's an economist, a former fellow at the Mises Institute. And we like to check in with him every now and then, especially when uh, there's a lot of uh, news in the financial press that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's fun to talk about. And boy, did last week have a lot of stuff going on that was fun to talk about. And uh, I want to look at really what I was kind of framing as a flip-flop from the, the entire financial corner of the mainstream media. So what happened last week is uh, on Wednesday, the FOMC, the Fed's policymaking body, had their, their press conference after the meeting and Jerome Powell gets up there and says, yeah, you know, things are generally under control. We're, we're data driven. We're not going to move the target policy interest rate at all. We're going to keep it five and a half. Uh, but we're we're going to come back to it. We're really considering uh, rate. This was like the first time he, in months he dropped a hint that maybe we'll raise the rate next time. So it seemed pretty clear to me that they were basically setting the stage to uh, push down rates again in September. So after a long time at five and a half, they were going to start pushing it down, probably a quarter of a percent. That's what everybody started to uh, expect after the Wednesday meeting. And this is what, 2.30 p.m. or so on uh, Wednesday, 2.30 Eastern. Now, so things seem ver serene, right? After the meeting, oh, the Fed's got things under control. It'll be all right. We'll just wait till September and then we'll get our expected rate cut and uh, soft, soft landing incoming, everybody. And in fact, we had people like saying literally that. Uh, <laughs> we had Mark Zandi, the uh, the perennial. I mean, you can't get more establishment economist than this guy, uh, saying that quote the economy is set to soft land unquote. He says this on Wednesday, and then everything changed on Friday, where we had a weak jobs report, but hardly a disastrous jobs report. Um, at least not if you're like in the real world, it came in below quote unquote expectations. Um, and so under 200,000 jobs created. And this was, or right around 200,000, I think maybe it was 217. I can't remember now what the number was. Um, but it was weak and below expectations. So then they start acting like this is a complete disaster. Um, okay, the economy added 114. Yeah, that's pretty, that is pretty weak, but it still added jobs. Also, they showed strength in both full-time and part-time jobs. The problem was it wasn't as strong as they, they wanted. And so then suddenly Wall Street absolutely freaks out and reverses their position from Wednesday, where uh, Mark Zandi now starts saying, oh, did I say soft landing, soft landing incoming? What I meant was... The Fed should have forced down rates a long time ago. They should have done it like a year ago. So now he's suddenly talking like, oh, I've been saying all along that, well, that they haven't been pushing down interest rates long enough. And then Fed's, and then you get all these other uh, Fed watchers on Wall Street saying, well, we need an emergency meeting from the Fed. We can't wait till September. We need them to push down rates now. And so just a lot of panic then. From Wall Street. Meanwhile, right, markets went down, I think, about uh, 650 that day. I don't know. And then on Monday, again, more. So you had basically a two-day total of like 1,500 uh, crash on the Dow. And so it's just really remarkable to see, A, how much everyone is obsessed with whatever the Fed is doing, and that there's essentially no talk mm -hmm. about what's going on with the actual economy. But then on top of that, how uh, you're just being made to believe that, okay, things were fine on Wednesday, but the terrible on Friday, even though there was continued job growth, and that the solution to everything is just simply push down the interest rate more and more. Maybe we had some people calling for, with <laughs> over the next two meetings, by September, two quarter percent um, push or two quarter percent decreases in the interest rate so that you would have half a percent just in the next couple of months, which is you're, you're getting pretty close to panic territory at this point. Uh, but let's just back up a little bit, I think, and then just talk about how, OK, well, we can see how everything now is driven by Fed policy. But what is the real state of the economy? What should what should we really be thinking about what's going on with the economy and what should the Fed be doing? Um, 
And so, I mean, I think to get the real take on things, I'm just going to ask you, Peter, right? Because I follow your almost daily videos on the state of the jobs reports and the economy. So uh, where are we really? Uh, let's not listen to what the Fed is saying about soft landing or the freaking out Wall Street people. I mean, what, what should our takeaway really be about the state of the economy right now? Yeah, so that was a great summary of uh, the past couple of weeks, which have been pretty exciting, not in a good way. And I think if you zoom out on the economy itself, the two most important factors right now are going to be the jobs, what's happening with jobs, uh, also known as growth, and what's happening with inflation. And in inflation, last year, it had been coming down sort of uh, month after month. And then starting around October, from around October to March, it leveled off and, in fact, it started increasing again. And at that point, you had a lot of chatter on Wall Street that now, now the recession is coming. Now, the past couple of, of months in inflation have been coming down again. The question there is, is it coming down because of the Fed's wise stewardship or is it coming down because the global economy is slowing? So Europe is right on the edge of recession. Japan dipped into technical recession. China is having a rough time. If all of these economies are doing badly, then you have less demand for things like commodities or specifically oil. And so that tends to tamper inflation worldwide, not for a good reason, not because the Fed did their job well, but just they got lucky that everybody else uh, you know, stepped on a banana peel. So inflation at this point, it's still, I think, about three and a half percent on an annual basis. That's still way above where the Fed needs it to be. The sort of standard central bank textbook says you do not cut rates when inflation is almost twice your target, right? Because cutting rates tends to make inflation go up, All right? But then what, so the sort of standard textbook would tell the Fed, do whatever you do, don't cut rates. You can, you know, think about letting these high rates continue working, but certainly don't cut them. And then what that's up against right now is the job. So as you mentioned, the job report, came in. There have actually been a couple of reports that came in really weak. Uh, the one on Friday was 114,000 jobs, but they also revised out about 30,000 previous jobs. So it netted out to about 80,000. In an economy of 335 million, that is roughly zero. Population grows at pretty close to that rate. Moreover, the jobs that we're seeing, this has been a pattern that we've seen all year where we are, quote unquote, uh, uh, creating as many part-time jobs as we're losing in full-time jobs, right? And those are both counted the same. So if you lose your job and you pick up a gig at Uber and, you know, part-time shift uh, parking uh, shopping carts at Walmart, right? You, that's plus one job. You've lost one, you've gained two, right? And so when you look at job composition, if you look at who's getting the jobs, uh, which is net, none of them are going to people who are actually born in the U.S., including immigrants born in the U.S. This is all imported people. Generally, when you import people, they bring the jobs with them. And so that's that's sort of fake in a way. That's not really telling you that the economy is doing well. That's just telling you that you're adding people. So it, when you sort of dig into the jobs numbers, they're very weak. Uh, and in now, again, according to the central bank textbook, if the jobs are super weak, then at that point, you have to cut rates, especially if rates are historically high as they are now. Right. So the Fed is in a pickle at the moment where on the one hand, inflation is telling them whatever you do, do not cut. Jobs is telling them cut as soon as possible, right? And so they, they, you know, they've been trying to thread that needle. Now, the crash on Friday seemed to be the jobs numbers. So Citi and Morgan both came out on Friday and call or actually predicted a full point of rate cuts in the next two meetings. So as you said, that is, that is panic territory for a central bank, right? Cutting a full point in two meetings. Uh, and then over the weekend, we had the uh, move in the Japanese yen, the Japanese carry trade broke down. That was essentially a bunch of hedge fundies, uh, hedge fund managers selling stuff in U.S. markets. So that then fed into the uh, panic, the jobs related panic that we got on, on Friday. And then we opened on Monday with another huge uh, crash in the markets. We had VIX, which is the, that's a volatility indicator in markets. It kind of tells you how much risk or distress or fear there is out there. VIX hit levels that we haven't seen since 2008 uh, outside of COVID. COVID. COVID basically broke all the numbers. So setting aside COVID, uh, we haven't seen that kind of stress since 2008. So that got a lot of people talking about Black Monday. 
Now, a third factor that I think is should be mentioned more, this is something that Charles Payne actually put up on his show. He had he tracked the Nasdaq against Kamala Harris's betting market odds. All right. And day for day, the peak in the Nasdaq was before Kamala came in, when Trump had these you know wonderful odds of winning in 2024, and then they got rid of <laughs> the zombie, and they put this new person in, almost immediately the market turned south with that. And every time Kamala goes up in the polls, stock markets are going down. I think the interpretation there is that Kamala is essentially Jimmy Carter in high heels. Right? She's extremely inflationary, loves the spending uh, even more than Trump. Uh, she's probably closer to Biden. Uh, regular, you know, in terms of regulations, uh, she wants to ban all drilling and or all fracking in the entire country. Joe Biden only wanted to ban it on federal lands. Across the board on tax cuts, right? Joe Biden wanted to get rid of the Trump tax cuts. If you make over four hundred thousand, Kamala wants to get rid of all of them. Across the board, she actually doubles down on Biden. She takes us really, I think, back to a Jimmy Carter type economic management. And I think that a big part, that's one of the reasons why, you know, even as the sort of stock market people are saying everything's fine, you know, uh, we're going to have the soft landing. Personally, I would be very careful about investing in this market for that reason. If the markets are tracking Kamala, then there is a very big unknown looming in a couple months that if she comes in, then I think that could be catastrophic for markets. I I think that uh, looking at last week, right, the, the, the question is, which was the correct, more down-to-earth reaction? And I think it was actually the Friday freakout that was probably more appropriate than the complacent Wednesday soft landing incoming reaction. So while as remarkable as it is that they just turned on a dime so fast, Really shame on Wall Street for being so devoted to the jobs numbers only and not seeing everything else that you and I were looking at in terms of the economy. Yeah, well, I think both you and I and, and Tho as well have mentioned that the Fed has never pulled off a soft landing. This is a fairy tale. This is a myth that they tell little central bankers so they can go to sleep at night. It, it, it's never done it in 110 you know, years at this point. Uh, every single time the media, you know, when the economy starts turning south, you, you can see it in the news stories. They start talking about soft landing. Here comes a soft landing. Every single time it doesn't, <laughs> it comes in hard. The media completely forgets that they ever called for this. And it's like they have no memory. You know, it's like the movie Memento where, you know, like they can't remember what happened three minutes ago. Every single time they come in again and now here they are pumping uh, the soft landing and, you know, I think people like Mark Zandi, they are part of the establishment. They know who pays their checks. They know who pays their speaking fees. They say what needs to be said politically. And at the moment, I think that's a combination where on the one hand, they're supposed to pretend that the soft landing is all being competently managed, that, you know, the Fed is guiding it in here. Uh, we're not actually going to have a serious recession. That's point one. And then point two which is kind of contradictory, is that they desperately want rate cuts because they want the economy to be stimulated in time for the November election, right? They know that the economy is Trump's strongest argument against the Biden-Harris administration. And so on the one hand, they want to claim that everything is fine, the adults are in charge. On the other hand, they also, if they see an opportunity, they want to reach out and try to grab those rate cuts so I think that accounts for part of the flip floppery that we've seen over these past couple of weeks. But I think it also should remind people that, you know, establishment uh, economists who comment on these things, these people, I mean, they, they, they don't actually do the math. Like they don't have any logic in many cases for the things they advocate. Uh, you saw Jeremy Siegel, who's, you know, a very establishment figure. He's been, uh, I think he wrote, was it Dow, Dow 10,000 way back in the day. He's been part of the establishment for a long time. He was calling for 1.5 uh, points of emergency cut last, uh, what, just three days ago. I mean, the, these people are not, you know, careful judges of the data like they present themselves. They are sensitive to the political narrative and they flip on a dime for, for no reason at all. Well, and let's note also they have no theory of boom and bust. 
other than right. right other than the fed causes busts on purpose like in a perfectly managed laboratory type setting if inflation gets too high right oh inflation too high so the fed will raise interest rates just the right amount to bring inflation down and minimize any sort of recessionary problem then it's just right back to normal and that's as complex as the whole idea gets in their head yeah, they, they live in a terrifying world. You know, they're all Keynesians. And so in their world, everything is ruled by animal spirits, by consensus, by this sort of like um, mass illusion that everybody lives under. And they live in constant terror that everybody's going to wake up one morning. And, you know, one of my complaints about the Fed or Treasury is that every time we have a recession, they're up there telling everybody that the banks are sound, the economy is strong, the soft landing is coming. They tell people this until everything collapses. And what they end up doing is the normies take it on the chin, right? Because normal people, they have jobs, they have families, they're not paying attention to the economy the way we are. They can't see through it. And so they really end up suckering the American people every single time. And I think the reason they do that is because they subscribe to this Keynesian world where it's all just this mass illusion. So if they can keep the illusion going, then maybe just maybe they can power through it this time and get on to the to the uh, you know Sundapples Hills on the other side for the economy. But of course, the reason, as you say, is because they have no idea why inflation happens, why recessions happen. They have no theory of this. It is just you have momentum. Everybody kind of believes in it. And then on Tuesday morning, or in this case, on Monday morning, all of a sudden, nobody believes it anymore. It's the darndest thing. So you would think that they would have some intellectual curiosity and might try to read, you know, some of the scholars that, you know, form the um, sort of foundation of the Austrian school that actually explain how these things happen. Uh, but maybe they don't care because, again, they are getting paid to say certain things and the checks keep clearing. So they keep saying it. Yeah, I don't think they care about scholarship or history or reading yeah. books other than self-improvement books and things like that. So, yeah, I just don't think there's much of an element to that there at all. I mean, I often wonder is what what if is what they're saying what they really believe in light of whatever their limited economic theory is or are they just saying that because that's what their employers want to hear? I can't yeah. I can't tell. Um because it's always bullish. And when it's obvious that the economy is in a bear situation, then they just call for lower interest rates and bailouts, and then it's on next to the bull. Then it's uh, on to the next bull market. So they they never attempt to explain the downturn or anything like that. Yeah, well, we saw that in two thousand eight, right? So it was an abject failure by the entire economics establishment. I think it was Queen Elizabeth who went to, to London School of Economics, and she asked them, "Why did you people not see this coming?" Uh, it was sort of nervous laughter around the room. No, no, really. Why are you people still employed? Like, if you, you have no idea what you're doing. And, you know, of course, after 2008, I mean, it was so obvious that nobody, uh, the mainstream didn't see it coming, that they did uh, talk a lot about, you know, how do we fix it? And it was, it was all just tweaks. Well, you know, we'll have to update our uh, correlations in the future uh, better. And, you know, it was just all these tweaks. Never, ever do they ask fundamentally perhaps our understanding of how the world works needs to be, um, uh, you know, changed. Like maybe we should actually pick up a book and understand how other points of view see things. Well, and I think the way this manifests itself in the debate is over the key phrase that you keep say seeing, which is policy error. And yeah. this is what right. you hear from the people who have this very simplistic view of how the Fed works, is the Fed will make a policy error by letting, by holding rates too high too long. I mean, first of all, I mean, the whole language there is wrong. Like the Fed is holding rates up or something. I mean, the Fed is massively pushing rates down and does that all the time through artificial interventions. And so the Fed has always got its its hand forcing down rates. It's not like it's do it's intervening to push them up. So there's always right. constant intervention as long as you've got low rates like we've got right now. Real market rates would uh, like this, like I get 99.9 percent .9 chance that they would be much much higher. And so the, what they're saying is that oh well they just screwed up. The reason there's going to be a recession is the Fed left rates too high too long. There's no other underlying reason. Right. Yeah, there's this beautiful study by, it's actually by the Bank of England, 
Uh, but they looked at real interest rates over the past, I think it was 800 years or 1,200 years. Uh, and they found that pretty regularly outside of wars, real interest rates tend to be about 3%. And that was amazingly consistent over those 800 years. And a lot happened in those 800 years. It's like the Black Plague. And I mean, there, were, there were a lot of weird things that went on during that period. And yet interest rates are fairly consistent. Of course, this is consistent with Austrian theory that it's a sort of a biological uh, phenomenon, interest rates, it's a matter of time preference. Uh, how much more do you value today uh, than tomorrow? But right, about 3%. And so that would imply that right now rates should be about 6.5%. Uh, so they're actually subsidized at the moment. Of course, they've been subsidized ever since the beginning of the Federal Reserve. Perhaps there was a moment during Volcker where we actually had realistic interest rates or slightly high interest rates. Although even then, if you track it against uh, inflation, I'm not sure that we ever did. But right, that's the job of the Fed is to hold it down. And so it's always a question of, in normal times, the Fed holds rates super duper down. And at the moment, they're only holding them slightly down. And so what appears to be this distress uh, is simply the delta between those, right? So as you know, crappy businesses, malinvestments that were founded when rates were zero uh, can't necessarily survive when rates are five. But that also, of course, goes to explain the sort of mainstream economics, rah, rah, you know, their, their instinct to cheer for any kind of rate cut. They are absolutely addicted to low rates uh, and, you know, all of the inflation that creates, the sort of tissue fire, uh, fake uh, growth that that creates uh, in the economy. So I, I, I think what the, these mainstream economists would be saying if they had any interest in the fundamentals behind the boom and bust cycle would be, hey, let's have a look at what the Fed has been doing since 2008 or maybe even 2001 where in 2001, they blew up the housing bubble. And then in 2008, there was all the bailouts and blowing up all sorts of other bubbles, I mean, which haven't even been counted at this point since they haven't been unwound yet. We're not even sure where all the bubbles are, all of the malinvestments caused. But yeah, there's no interest in that. The, the, the real policy error has been occurring over the last 22, 23 years. It's been just nonstop inflationary, easy money, monetary policy. That's the policy area error that's creating the inflation we deal with, that's the causing the hollowing out of the middle class, that's causing the inequalities that we now see. That's the policy error. Letting interest rates slightly inch up from their 1% is not the policy error. That's, that's letting markets have slightly more control over the situation. And so there's no error to be found there. The error is over the last 20 years. But you're not going to hear that anywhere from any of these, these Wall Street guys or Fed economists, that's for sure. Yeah, and that's a longstanding issue, right, is that every time that these guys look at the recession, they don't look at the gasoline, they don't look at the match, they don't look at any of the reasons why the recession came. They have like this very myopic view of just, you know, the past 12 months or whatever. And of course, what you have to do is every single cycle, you have to go back to the beginning of the cycle. So if you're looking at 1929, you have to start the story after 1921 too, after the forgotten depression of 2122. If you're looking at the current situation, you've got to look back to at least 2008, Arguably, you have to go back, maybe all the way back to Nixon, right? Because it's not like we have recessions anymore that clear out all of the garbage, right? That The last one that happened was back in the early 1920s. We have more like they move heaven and earth to try to stop the liquidation of all the garbage, and then we start laying on a brand new layer, right? And so, I mean, really, like, if you want to understand what's happening in the current recession, You've got to go back quite a ways, more or less, to when uh, they stopped doing that. At an absolute minimum, really, I think you've got to start the analysis with uh, Richard Nixon, you know, who really um, started the gun on these massive government deficits, the buildup of debt, uh, you know, interest rates, inflation. Uh, that sort of was a regime change versus the relatively conservative central banking from, you know, 1913 up until Richard Nixon. And then since then, it's been just absolutely wild. You know, consider when you watch a movie from back in the day, a banker is a very conservative guy. He's got a monocle. He's got his watch. You know, he's always watching where the pound is. Uh, and all of a sudden, then they all flip to like, co you know, cocaine and hookers. And it's like, what? What happened between those two, right? Something fundamentally 
changed in the financial system. And so, you know, this isn't a question the past eight months, the policy error, the Fed should have done this and they could have done that. This isn't like Larry Summers style tweaking. This is much more fundamental if you are trying to constantly pump out money and uh, push interest rates artificially low, you are going to have these blowups. Well, and speaking of of that, um, you know, the, the problems with the Fed, the way this our central bank operates, is not unique to us. Um, and of course, there's a, a global component to. I mean, one of the strengths that the dollar has going on right now is the extent to which insanity is commonplace around the globe with most central bankers. And Japan is, is one of the most fascinating examples out there. One of the examples that MMT has been pointing to as a justification for, look how great this works over in Japan. Well, people right now are kind of recognizing that maybe that is not such a great model for the world. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know one of the things that got caused a lot of the panic over the weekend um, is fallout from the Bank of Japan's um, you know, rhetoric out of there. There's been the, the yen has been declining for for several months now. Right of the dollar, you know, the, their interest rates have been extremely low for for even larger than longer than the United States. Can, can you talk about just kind of what makes Bank of Japan so unique, um, and kind of why would that have an impact in American markets and kind of spook you know have have consequences uh, with how Americans' uh, economic well being is doing. Yeah, so I think in many ways, the Bank of Japan is where we're headed. They're sort of the canary in the coal mine. And they've done two things that we are now copying, unfortunately. One of them is that they very much became a tool of the government, right? In other words, the the prime minister, the the, the politicians currently running the country. Uh, they monetized just an enormous amount of debt uh, to the point where over half of Japanese government bonds First of all, there's a ton of Japanese government bonds, right? It's about 260% of GDP, which is roughly twice what our national debt is relative to the economy. There's a ton of Japanese government bonds out there. And over half of those are owned by the Bank of Japan. So effectively, they printed the money and just handed it straight over to the government. Uh, we are headed in that direction, unfortunately. That was you know, one thing that we've seen since COVID is that the Fed is buying an enormous amount of government debt. They're now trying to at least, well, they were trying to taper it very, very gradually. Uh, but that's something that really started in the big way in the 2008 crisis and then again uh, during COVID. So that's number one is that the, the Central Bank of Japan has really just become an almost an in-house money printer for the Japanese government. Uh, and then the other is that the, you know, when we talk about artificially pushing rates down, I mean, Japan has just, you know, they've had near zero interest rates for going on 20 years at this point. And that, in the short term, when you push rates down like that, uh, it stimulates the economy. You get like this tissue fire, you know, everybody can borrow money now and you get a lot of entrepreneurial activity. That's the reason they do it. Sure, it creates inflation, but you get the short term tissue fire. The problem, and Jim Grant talks about this, is that if you've got very low interest rates for a long time, it saps the economy because you're no longer rationing credit necessarily by the quality of the business. Just everybody gets money. Okay. And so crappy businesses, they uh, proliferate to the point where they're actually hogging up significant amounts of workers and other resources. So the entire economy becomes like this zombie sluggish economy because of the low rates. Now, the problem is that once you're doing that for 20 years of near zero interest rates, how do you get out of it, right? How do you get back to normalized rates to where you are actually allocating capital according to the firms who can use it best? And to get from here to there is extremely painful, right? First off, you know, if you've had rates at 0% for 20 years and you try to hike them to 3%, 4% real, you're going to wipe out a whole ton of companies that's going to be extremely uh, unpopular. The second is that by doing that, you are going to crash the value of bonds, like Japanese government bonds, like those 260% of GDP Japanese government bonds, which make up the overwhelming assets in Japanese banks and pensions, right? So at this point, the Bank of Japan has backed them into this corner where the 0% rates are no longer growing the economy. In fact, they're making it slower. But the only way out of those is going to be an epic, potentially Paul Volcker style uh, recession, a depression, combined with wiping out a significant chunk of Japanese banks and Japanese pensions. 
Japanese voters are not going to like that at all. You know, the current Japanese government is sporting like a 28% approval rating. They cannot do that. And so what we saw the other day when the Bank of Japan, they announced that they were going to hike rates for the first time in 20 years. This made the yen soar because it meant that, you know, Japanese assets are not going to pay so badly in the future. So the Japanese assets soared. This wrecked all these hedge funders who had borrowed yen because yen didn't cost anything and they were investing that in treasuries. So anyway, uh, they all got wiped out. But that was a taste of what comes if the Bank of Japan actually tries to get rates. Right. When they moved them the other day, they moved them from like 0.15 to 0.25. Okay. If they try to get rates up to 3%, that is going to be absolutely catastrophic for the economy. They cannot do that. Well, and I think the whole thing just illustrates uh, how this is the life, this sort of foreign central bank mismanagement has just really been the lifeblood of the U.S. dollar in the sense that, right, the, the, the American central bank could always count on the European central bank and the Bank of Japan to devalue their own currencies even more. And because they're they're backed into the same problems, except they don't have the growth potential that the Americans have. Uh, right. Whereas the Americans, yeah, Americans are in a huge debt problem. Yeah, we've got an aging population. We've got similar problems to all these other places, but they're just not as bad. They're just not to the same degree. And so the, the U.S. just simply isn't, isn't as much painted in the corner the way those other banks are and, um, and benefits from that immensely because these other central banks are really just kind of like groping around for what they can do while still trying to keep their interest rates rock bottom, but knowing that that builds uh, catastrophic problems for the future. Yeah, it's like they all joke about the two runners or the two hikers who come across the bear, right? The one guy puts his shoes on. He says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And in this case, right, the saving grace of the U.S. is that as bad as, you know, Bidenomics and all this has been, uh, foreigners are even worse. So, you know, China is in a world of pain now. They've dumped out all this money to try to subsidize green energy and manufacturing uh, and property. That's not blowing back on them. Uh, Japan has the zero interest rate problem. Europe you know, between energy and uh, importing uh, new people who may not be as productive as the people who are already there, uh, Europe has a world of pain. And so, the, you know, the U.S. really doesn't have to work very hard to survive at this point. Not, I mean, certainly not in terms of the U.S. dollar, for example, which has held up very well. In fact, the U.S. dollar uh, has been strong over the past couple of years. You know, when we talk about de-dollarization, the actual dollar itself has been very strong, partly because there are these sort of mini crises blossoming them up all over the world, partly thanks to the U.S. in the first place, things like Ukraine. Uh, and then those force foreigners into a flight to safety, which at the moment happens to be the U.S. dollar. Now, of course, even more so is it gold. But for a variety of reasons, you know, banks can't uh, put that much capital into gold. There's a number of regulatory reasons why uh, most of the money in the world can't go into gold the way that it can go into the dollar. But at the moment... Yeah, the U.S., this is kind of the saving grace. This is what's keeping us from the abyss is the incompetence of the Japanese, the Chinese, the Europeans. Well, it definitely goes to the strength of the dollar. And again, yeah, that's relative to the rest of the world. But the problem is, is that like so much of Americans' financial well-being is based entirely upon these hedge funds and the like. Um, and, and, and corporations taking advantage of playing the stupidity of the Japanese central bank against the Fed. And so you have all yeah. this stuff that's just, it's just playing all these arbitrages that, that at the end of the day, though, has a real effect in terms of, you know, effectively the savings of a large percentage of the country, since so many people are dependent upon their stock market portfolio for their wealth. I mean, we push everyone into these, in, into these markets, um, you know, with the inability of saving in traditional means. And so that's where, you know, the carry trade and, and the Bank of Japan has a massive impact on, on, on the just the, the, the both the, the real savings, the effective savings rate of, of Americans and, and the, their direct uh, a mental well-being on terms of their economic solvency is because it's, it's the extent to which the economy is no longer about actually building stuff, but it's about these games dealing with paper and again, taking advantage of this, again, the, 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 the relative advantage of Fed policy versus the insanity of the Bank of Japan. I mean, that's, this, is the, this is how we get into economic crazy world. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And people who never wanted to play that game are forced to play that game, right? There are millions of retirees in America who do not want to play the stock market, but they have to, 
right? If they don't play the stock market, then their money's going to vanish. Their retirement's going to vanish. They're going to be, you know, working at 80 uh, part time as a greeter at Walmart. So they're forced to play these games. And of course, especially once you've got a central bank run world, there are just endless ways for the hedge funds and the banks to fleece the population. You know, if you go back to the leverage buyouts, for example, back, uh, you know, this was soon after Nixon back in the 80s. And these characters were borrowing all of this money because, you know, the Fed was subsidizing capital, right? So it was very, very cheap to borrow money. Uh, you could fleece these companies, wipe out the companies, the jobs, the communities. I mean, regular people have been victimized by the financial system in a sense forever, but that really accelerated first off with central banking and then secondly, since the Nixon shock, where, you know, if you look at finance as a share of GDP since 1970, it has exploded absolutely worldwide. There's a number of countries where it's, it, it, it's dominant, you know, places like Luxembourg or Switzerland, they barely have an economy outside of finance. Uh, even places like London or the U.S. increasingly, a fifth or more of the economy are almost utterly useless. They're, they're essentially just uh, shell games fleecing the population. And in order to try desperately to protect themselves from that, regular Americans have to sit around and try to figure out uh, what's going on with the stock market. What are the hedge funders doing in Tokyo this week? They're not qualified and, uh, you know, to protect themselves in that. And they never wanted that. They, they just want to be able to save in peace, you know, step by step towards uh, their financial security. Well, this is the part of the show where we do predictions. So <laughs> let's look a few months ahead. What, what do you think the state of the economy is going to be on Election Day? And what do you think it's then going to be in December once the election's over? And this could, of course, depend a lot on just the general unwinding of things. It could also depend, depend a lot on the central bank. Um, so let me, you know, to phrase it like John McLaughlin used to phrase it on his show, right? On a scale of one to 10, with one being, uh, you know, probably not to 10 being total metaphysical certitude. What, what do you think are the odds of the Fed doing, of hitting the panic button before election day and really driving down rates? Are they going to, is, is Powell going to try and save face by pushing that out? Or are they just going to go all in with trying to, trying to get the economy going again, uh, full, full steam ahead before November? Okay, so I'm cheating because I'm looking at the CME Fed Watch, all right? And we've got Target, all right, we've got about a three-quarter drop in rates by Election Day. That's what the market expects. Uh, but in the spirit of the question of putting my neck out there uh, for a prediction that will probably be wrong, uh, I think they're going to cut more than that. I think that partly they are going to do it because we're going to have more deterioration in jobs. Uh, I think partly they're going to do it just because they're going to get political pressure uh, to try to make things look good for the election. So I think they're going to cut more than that. If I had to guess, I would guess about uh, a point or a point and a quarter from here. So that takes us through election day. I think that markets will go down because the prospect of a Kamala presidency will scare the markets more and more. I think currently it's still a uh, relatively abstract possibility. Uh, in terms of after the election, I think that completely depends on who wins. If we look back last time in 2016, in many ways, we had a similar economy. So the late 2016 economy, that was when Trump was running against Hillary. And the economy at that time was late stage. It was, you know, everything was kind of petering out. Uh, it had been eight years since the previous recession. That's, that's kind of, you know, past its uh, sell-by date. So things were actually really slow. And then when Trump came in, there was a lot of optimism, markets soared. Uh, there was a lot of hope that he would engage in deregulation, which he did do to the extent he could. He, he tried, <laughs> there were a lot of lawsuits that blocked him. He wanted to do a lot more. Uh, so if we just sort of take 2016 as the template, I think that post-election absolutely depends on who's president. Of course, in the sane world, the president wouldn't matter any more than the central bank matters, but unfortunately here we are. Uh, so if Kamala comes in, then I think that we are pretty much due for the recession. I think that we'll see a capital strike that a lot of companies will uh, cut back on investment to kind of wait and see. And if enough companies do that, then, you know, of course, that 
that brings the recession. Uh, on the other hand, if Trump comes in, then I imagine that we're going to see something like 2016, where we'll see, at least initially, we'll see euphoria in, in the markets. Uh, we'll see hopes for more uh, regulatory um, relief. And at that point, I think it's really a question of if Trump wins, does the kind of people he hires, I think, is going to be watched by a lot of people to see whether he's learned his lesson from last time. Last time he was a bit naive coming in. I, I, I think rhetorically he said that it was a swamp that needed to be drained. But I don't think he fully appreciated how true that was. Uh, so I think that that's, you know, in, in order to have a happy ending, say, a year from now, I think that we'd have to look at a Trump victory and then Trump would actually have to surround himself with competent people who understand the gravity of the situation and how many people need to be uh, exited from the deep state. So, Bishop, what do you think? Well, I'm still trying to figure out exactly you know, the, the, the shift in polling. I mean, in terms, in terms of the Fed, I mean, I definitely expect Powell to, to cave, though. Again, you know, to his credit, he has, he has proved us wrong in the past. He, you know, it's if you know, I, his relationship with you know, I don't think he has a, you know, bright future prospects with, a, a, with any of the electoral outcomes. So it'll be interesting to kind of see where his uh, uh, what sort of legacy he wants to, to leave there, which I, I think is, a, is an open question. I mean, he, he can he's he's overperformed very, very low expectations. Uh, through that, but again, I expect pressure to be, you know, when, once jobs numbers really start hitting, I, I expect him to, to cave there. Um, in terms of electoral outcomes and, and you know, whatever boom that might come from that, I'm still trigger, trying to figure out who are these people that are massively shifting to Kamala Harris after Biden. Um, how much of that is an, an astroturf manipulation of the polls, sort of propaganda sort of aspect, and how much of that kind of reflects real voter sentiment? I mean, you're going can, similar to, to the, you know, the financial markets. How much of this is, is paper and, and kind of vibes um, that are being dictated by uh, uh, you know, powers that be, and how much of that actually hits down to, to the real uh, real America? I'm, I, I still have a hard time um, feeling how, you know, given this depressed state of the real economy, given the extent that inflation, no matter how much they talk about it going down, is still affecting, is still the number one issue with American voters. I have a, just in, in my gut, I have a very difficult time seeing people saying, oh, well, Kamala will do it better than Biden did, right? So we'll, we'll give the Democrats another four years. Um, but voters have proved me wrong in the past. Again, I expected 2022 to go much differently there. Um, so again, I, I just, it's the last month has just been so wild. On the on the political side of it, and again, it's unfortunate to the extent that the political realities, you know, have a direct impact on the economic realities. Um, again, in the, this wonderful clown world that we've created for ourselves. Well, my prediction is that Powell's only going to slightly cave. I think I think we will get cuts in September and October, but that's it. Just half. Um, just half a percentage point, because I think it won't take very much at all to make the uh, stock market surge to make everybody on Wall Street start talking about how great everything it is again, that soft landing is back, baby. And also, I think the timing is enough that if you look in the past, right, the Fed always starts hiking again once the recession has already started. So it's a fairly safe bet that the recession's already started at some point, and so now's a good time for the Fed to start hiking. That's how they always do it. But they still don't call the recession until months later. So I think we'll, yep. st we'll still be able to say, oh, we're not in recession, soft landing incoming, even if they've been hiking or even if they've been lowering rates. Um, that's what I mean is they keep they start lowering once the recession has already started. They said that in reverse. Yeah, the, the, the loosening cycle begins again. Um, after things already turn bad, once you look back at the actual recession data. So uh, you can start loosening and still claim that the recession has not begun yet uh, because that's what they've done every cycle for 30 or more years is they've started loosening and then they start saying, oh, we prevented a, a serious recession because we started loosening just in time. They said that in 2001, they said that in 2007, in 2008. And the Fed, remember, was still saying, Bernanke was saying, we do not see any recession on the horizon into the spring of 2008. And But we now know that officially the recession started in December of 2007. So they're months in and saying, oh no, there's no recession on the horizon. Now, I should note that I don't think the Fed believes it when they say those things. I think they know what's going on. It's just that what the Fed says and the Fed's predictions are all propaganda numbers and they're, decide, they're designed to just keep the markets calm. I, I, don't, I don't know how much of a correlation there is between what Fed, the Fed actually sees is going on in the economy and what they actually say is going on. So I think they can still keep 
uh, a, a, uh, an illusion of soft landing incoming, that things are fine well into late October, even if the jobs numbers still start to look bad. And they can take the edge off by cutting that, uh, there was 25 basis points at each of the two meetings upcoming. So Powell will deliver, I think, a very moderate outcome, and they'll still be claiming everything is fine. The question is, are, are things still fine enough in the daily lives of ordinary voters that they're still going to think, that they're going to believe that things are fine? Everyone I talk to in the real world thinks that they are screwed. The, the costs of everything are so high, they're not confident about their job prospects, they're their, the uh, insurance costs, the auto repair costs, their, their homeowner's insurance, rent if you're paying it. It's all so terrible. Um, there's clearly a disconnect between that, the, the, the narrative of your personal life and the narrative of what you're told by Wall Street and the Fed. Um, so it remains a mystery as to which of those narratives will win out by election day. But I do think that on a macro level, at the high up levels of uh, policymakers and so on, the Fed can definitely keep this illusion going for the next 90 days. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Peter St. Ange from the Heritage Foundation. And be sure and follow him also on Twitter. And uh, we'll link to that in our description. He's got almost Time daily for a sub stack. Videos. And on Substack, you can subscribe, and I, I follow it pretty closely. Uh, I find a lot of it to be uh, pretty useful, so I encourage you to follow him. We'll have him, of course, back again in the future, uh, but we will be back next week with more, so we'll see you next time. Before you go, guys, I want to make sure you know about an upcoming event in Albuquerque next month. This will be featuring me and Peter Klein. We'll be in Albuquerque to talk about the topic of living free in an unfree world. For more on this event, visit Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot -E and click on events.